Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Meet the Author series. Allow me to introduce our speaker to you. Dr. Gary Chapman is an author, speaker, and counselor. He has a passion for people and for helping them form lasting relationships. Dr. Chapman is a well-known marriage counselor and director of marriage seminars. The Five Love Languages is one of his most popular titles, topping various bestseller charts for years, selling over 20 million copies, and has been on the New York Times bestsellers list since 2007. Dr. Chapman has been directly involved in real life family counseling since the beginning of his ministry years and his nationally syndicated radio programs air nationally on Moody Radio Network and over 400 affiliate stations. Today, Dr. Chapman will discuss his book, The Five Love Languages of Teenagers. Over to you, Dr. Chapman. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you and all those who are watching and perhaps will watch. Uh, we're talking about what I believe to be the most important word in the English language and the most confusing word in the English language. I say that love is the most important word because if you examine our literature, our music, our theater, our religions, you find that love is a central theme in all of them. But I say that love is a most confusing word because we use the word love in a thousand ways. We say, for example, I love hot dogs. <laughs> or here in North Carolina where I live, we say, I love barbecue. And in North Carolina, that's always pork barbecue, okay? Then I hear people say, oh, I love the mountains. I love the beach. I love my new car. I love my dog. And then, and then we say to a special someone, I love you. What is that supposed to mean? Hot dogs and barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> well, today we're not talking about a thousand ways we use the word love. We're talking only about one way, and that is love as an emotional need. Almost everyone agrees that one of our deepest emotional needs on the human level is the need to feel loved by the significant people in our lives. Today, we're going to focus on teenagers and effectively meeting that emotional need for love. Now, people have asked me, where did I come up with the love language concept? It actually grew out of my counseling, uh, particularly my marriage counseling, at least at first. That's where I focused on. And uh, a husband would say, or a wife would say, I just feel like they don't love me. And the other would say, I don't get it. I do this and this and this and this, and they don't feel loved. I don't get it. And I realized that people were being sincere. They were sincerely expressing love, but the other person was not getting it emotionally. <clears throat> it was not meeting that emotional need for love. And so uh, eventually what I did, because I heard this over and over in my office, I went back and read several years of notes that I made when I was counseling and asked myself the question, when someone said, I feel like my spouse doesn't love me. What did they want? What were they crying about? What were they complaining about? And their answers fell into five categories. And I later called them the five love languages. And I started using that in my counseling, that if you want her to feel love, you've got to learn to speak her love language. If you want him to feel love, you've got to learn to speak his language. And then I would help couples discover what I call their primary love language that one of these five is more important than any of the other four. And I'd help challenge them to go home and try it. And sometimes they would come back in three weeks and say, Gary, this is changing everything. And then I started using with small groups and the same thing would happen. Probably five years later, I thought, you know, if I could put this concept in a book and write it in the language of the common person so everyone could understand it, maybe I could help a lot of couples I would never have time to see in my office. Of course, little did I know that as I was said earlier, it's sold now for 20 million copies. It's been translated in over 50 languages around the world. And following that rather closely, I teamed up with Dr. Ross Campbell, uh, a psychiatrist who had had 30 years experience with children. And we wrote the five love languages of children. Same five languages, but how this applies with children. Then 
parents began to say after a few years, you know, the children's book really, really helped us. But now our children are teenagers and we're doing the same thing we've been doing and it doesn't seem to be working. What happens? Does this really work with teenagers? <laughs> that motivated me to write the book we're gonna talk about today. And that is the five love languages for teenagers. Same five languages, but applied to teenagers. I remember a 13 year old young man who had run away from home. He was sitting in my office and in our conversation, he said to me, my parents don't love me. They love my brother, but they don't love me. I knew his parents. I knew they loved him. The problem was not that they were loving. The problem was they had never learned to speak his love language. So he said they love my brother, but they don't love me. His brother felt love. He didn't feel love. So for, the, for parents, the question is not, do you love your teenager? We tend to love our teenagers by nature. They're our biological children, or maybe they're our adopted children, but we love them. But they don't always feel loved. See, the question is, does the teenager feel loved? So what we're talking about is how to effectively communicate your love in a way that the teenager is going to feel loved. And again, almost everyone agrees that if teenagers feel secure in the love of their parents or those who are serving as their parents, everything else in their life is going to be affected in a positive way by that. So we're talking about one of the huge issues in terms of meeting teenagers' needs, which will affect everything else in their life. So this is really an important topic, and I'm glad you're with us today to discuss it. So let's just kind of walk our way through uh, these five love languages. If you have read the book, it'll be an introduction. I mean, it'll be a, a review. <laughs> if you haven't, it'll be an introduction. Uh, but at any rate, I hope that our time together today is going to help you in your relationship with teenagers, whether you're a parent or a school teacher or anyone who has a close relationship with teenagers. So let's just look at them. And these are in no particular order of importance, okay? But number one is words of affirmation. Using words to affirm the other person. Uh, you know, there's an ancient Hebrew proverb that says life and death is in the power of the tongue. We can kill our relationship with teenagers with negative, harsh, cruel comments to them. Or we can give them life by speaking words of affirmation, words that affirm them. And in all of these languages, we have what I call dialects, just as in spoken languages, we all have a language, but we also have a dialect. I speak English with a Southern accent, <laughs> but the people in Boston speak differently from me, have a different accent, same language. And so uh, let me just give you a couple of the, uh, the dialects of words of affirmation. One of them is words of praise. This focuses on their performance. Uh, that was a great shot you made on that, man. That's tremendous. Oh, man, you were fabulous in that concert you gave tonight or that rendering you gave tonight. It's just looking for things that they either do or say that you want to affirm. Uh, perhaps... Uh, you say to a teenage son who's playing basketball after it's all over, hey, man, I noticed that when Johnny mixed, missed that shot, you went over and gave him a word of encouragement. Man, I like that about you. We want to do that, man. We want to encourage people. So you just found something that he did that you liked, and you just verbally affirmed it. Uh, words of praise. Now, let me suggest that you praise teenagers for effort, not for perfection. I remember uh, I was visiting a young teenager, a young man, uh, 14 years old, uh, in the hospital with stomach ulcers. And in my effort to try to find out what might be going on, I said to him, uh, how do you and your father uh, get along? And he said, I don't ever please my father. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, if I make a B on my report card, he will say, you should have made an A, son. You're smarter than this. He said, if I am playing baseball and I get a double after the game's over, my father will say, you should have made a triple out of that. You've got to learn how to make a triple out of a double. And later he said, if I mow the grass, my father will say, you didn't get this grass under the bushes. You've got to learn how to do that. 
I knew what his father was trying to do. He was trying to motivate him to give 100%. Do your best. But do you hear what the teenager was hearing? I don't ever <clears throat> please my father. You see, praise them for the effort, not for perfection. If they make a B on report card, praise them for the B. Yay, B. <laughs> then, after report card is back on the teacher's desk, you can say, you know, it's really good. You made that B last, last quarter. I wonder what we could do to bring that up to an A minus this quarter. You bet so, man. They're with you now. You know, you've already affirmed what they did, and now you're giving them an affirming word later. Uh, like on mowing the grass. You don't criticize them for not getting under the bushes when they get through mowing the grass. Praise them for effort. Look at all the grass that's been cut. Man, this is wonderful. <laughs> it's next week when they start to mow that you say, son, I want to show you something. This is kind of hard to do uh, because you have to go in and out. But under the, under the bushes, if you just go in and out, you can get it. And I know you can. You bet they will. You see, you've already affirmed their effort. Now you're giving them instruction on how to make it even better. So uh, when they finish a task, don't look for perfection. Praise them for what they did, for their effort. Incidentally, those of you that are married, this works really well with your husband. Okay. <laughs> so he took the trash out only one time this month. You just say, honey, I, I, I really appreciate you taking the trash out. That meant so much to me. Yeah, and maybe you'll take it out twice next month. <laughs> so praise should always be for effort, not for perfection. Okay. And then not only is there praise, but there are words of affection. The most common words are, I love you. I'm surprised at how many young adults I meet who say to me, I never heard my father say the words, I love you. I think he did, but I never heard him say that. And I don't know why that is, unless perhaps the father didn't receive those words himself when he was growing up. But words of affection for teenagers are extremely important. That you're expressing value for who they are. This is not something they've done. It's just for who they are. And uh, you can use words of affection or you can focus on something about their personality. To so, say, so, you know, one of the things I really like about you is your humor. And you've got great humor. You can focus on the way they look. You know, I, I, I just want to say this. Man, you, you're getting muscular on me here in these teenage years or something else. If, uh, if, it's, a, if it's a gal, well, she can be muscular too, I guess. But you can, well, look for something about the way they look, the way they talk, the way they treat other people that, uh, that you, you, you want to affirm. And you can always find things to affirm. You see, sometimes teenagers get the feeling that, uh, as, the, as the teenager said earlier, I, I just don't ever please my parents because they don't ever get any affirming words uh, for anything about their lives. So these, these are really, really important words of affirmation. Let me just give you a flavor because what we did in writing this book, we actually interviewed a lot of teenagers and we asked them, you know, do your parents love you on a scale of zero to 10? And then whatever they said, we said, why? Why do you say that? Let me give you some examples. This is Bethany. She's 13. Quote, I know my mother loves me. She tells me all the time. I think my dad does too, but he doesn't say it. Then there's Jeremiah, who's 15. He lives in Chicago's inner city. Quote, I don't have a dad except these guys at the center, but I know my mom loves me. She tells me how proud she is of me and encourages me to make something of myself. Cassidy is 18. Quote, I'm going off to college in a few months. I think I'm the luckiest girl alive. My parents both love me, even though the diff even through the difficult teen years, they've always encouraged me. My dad says, you're the greatest. And my mom says, you can be whatever you want to be. I just hope I can help some other people the way they have helped me. Give you one other example. Emma is 14 and an eighth grader. Quote, my mom left when I was four years old, so I don't remember her. But later, my dad married my stepmother. I consider her my mother. Sometimes when I get down on myself, 
She tells me how much she loves me, and she tells me good things about myself that I sometimes forget. I couldn't make it without her. Obviously, for those teenagers, words of affirmation is their primary love language. This is what really makes them feel loved. Words of affirmation. Okay, let's go to number two. Physical touch. We've long known the emotional power of physical touch. That's why when they're babies, we pick them up and hold them and cuddle them and kiss them. Long before the baby understands the meaning of the word love, the baby feels love by physical touch. Now, with teenagers, however, it's when you touch and where you touch. I think this is one reason why uh, parents said to me, you know, we read your book on children and uh, our, our son lets their, our daughter's language was physical touch. And so we would give them hugs and kisses and, you know, and, and, but now they're teenagers and they don't always receive hugs and, and, and kisses. And, and, and we don't know what's going on. But one of the things that's going on is that that teenager is beginning to develop a sense of independence. They're becoming a person on their own now in the process, okay? <clears throat> and so when they're 10 years old and they play ball, you can go out after the game's over and just hug your son or hug your daughter, whatever the game was, and right there in front of everybody. They love it. You do that when they're 13 or 14, and they're likely to push you away. Don't do that, Mom. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you see, we have to move from public touch to private touch, touching them when they are with you alone, not in front of their friends, because their friends will think they're, you're being treated like a kid, and they're not kids anymore. They're teenagers now, <laughs> so you have to choose that. Here's another factor. Teenagers' emotions are going like this, depending on what happens throughout the day. In the morning, they can receive a hug from you and just eat it up. Afternoon, you reach out to hug them and they just push you off. Why? Because something happened today. They were super happy this morning, but now they're down emotionally and they're just kind of, they want to be, they want to be by themselves. So don't get turned off by that. Don't feel like they're rejecting you. It's just where they are emotionally. Sometimes even the distance that they are from you will give you a clue on whether to touch them or not to touch them. If they're standing, you know, four five, six feet away, and they're kind of upset about something, probably physical touch is not going to work at that point. But if they're standing real close to you, kind of bumping up against you, that's a wonderful time to hug them. They're almost asking for it. I remember a mother who said to me, my 13-year-old son used to annoy me. I'd be washing dishes. He would come up and put behind me, put his arms around me over my eyes while I was washing dishes. And I, it used to irritate me. But after I read your book, I realized he was asking for physical touch. <laughs> so I just turned around and hugged him with wet hands and all. <laughs> he loved it. Uh, so you have to take the cues that they're giving you along the way as to whether this is a good time to touch or not to touch. I want to throw this out also. I find a lot of fathers who tend in the teenage years to draw back from hugging their daughters because they've heard so much about sexual abuse and they don't, want to, they don't want to even risk anything like that. And so they begin to pull back. And, and here's what I say, if her language is physical touch, she needs your hugs during the teenage years as much as she did when she was a child. And if you don't hug her, kiss her on the cheek, she'll find an eight year old, 18 year old boy who will. So don't draw back. Now I understand that you know, sexual abuse is, is, is rather rampant in our country. We, we don't, don't want to in any way affirm, affirm that. But, uh, and for mothers, if that's going on and you're aware of it, you need to be the one to take action against that father so that that does not happen in your, in your home. But, um, but in meeting that emotional need for love, that child, the ideal is that they will feel loved by their mom and by their dad to mom and dad are both speaking their primary love language uh, on a regular basis, okay? Uh, just give you a couple of examples of that, uh, of some teenage teenagers who are responding to us. Uh, this is uh, Victoria. She's 16. She lives with her single parent mother. Quote, I love it when mom gives me back rubs. All my problems seem to go away when mom rubs my back. 
And then Joel is 17. I know my dad loves me. He's always bumping me. <laughs> he elbows me when we're watching a game together. He hits me on the shoulder and trips me when I walk by. Sometimes I'm not in the mood to be touched, and dad respects that. But the next day, he bumps me when I walk by. I love it. Obviously, his language is physical touch. Meredith was 15. My dad doesn't hug me as much as he used to. I don't know if he thinks that I'm an adult now and don't need it, but I miss his hugs. They always make me feel special. That illustrates what I just said. A Barrett, uh, who had a rough year with algebra this year, he said, quote, the best part of my homework is when mom comes by and rubs my shoulders. I forget all about algebra. <laughs> it relaxes me. When she walks away, I feel better. Uh, Jessica, 17. I know that sometimes I'm hard to live with. My parents have to put up with a lot of my moods. I guess it's just being a teenager. But when they hug me or even touch my arm, I feel like everything's going to be okay. It's like a calming thing. I know that they really love me. So for these two teenagers, physical touch is their primary love language. Okay. Number three, quality time. Giving the teenager your undivided attention. And the words undivided are really, really important when it comes to quality time. Now, one of the dialects of quality time is quality conversations. Just interfacing back and forth on any topic of interest to the teenager or to you in which you're giving them your undivided attention. Let me say this. You're having a conversation with your teenager it's not the time to be multitasking and doing something else while you're having this conversation. Give them your full attention. If their quality time, if this is their language, if you don't give them your undivided attention, they're not feeling love by the conversation. Now, let me just also throw this out. If when you are having a conversation with your teenager and your phone rings and you answer your phone, you have just unconsciously communicated that teenager, someone out there is more important than my conversation with you. I know that's not your intention, but that's the message that may, may well be coming through. Now I know if you are an emergency person, a doctor or, what, or a fire person or whatever, I know you, you, you get emergency calls and you have to take them. But in those cases, you say, your child knows that, your teenager knows that, so you say, Son, I've got to take this, it's an emergency, but hang, hang on, as soon as I get off the phone, I want to finish that conversation. Or if I have to leave, we're going to finish it tonight, okay? You just assure them that your conversation with them is important. Uh, so uh, giving a quality conversation. Now, let me just give you a couple of ideas on quality conversation. Eye contact is extremely important. Look at them in their eyes. And even if they're looking away, as soon as they come back, you, you focus in on them, okay? Another, another uh, important aspect of conversation is ask questions. I've sometimes said to parents of teenagers, you should listen twice as much as you talk. You see, we, we, some of us at least are designed to talk, 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 and we're always talking, talking. Let's learn how to ask questions of our teenagers so they can talk. So even if they tend to be, uh, you know, rather quiet, the more you ask questions, the easier it is for them to talk. You can ask questions about anything. Even if you're discussing something that might be a conflict area between you and them, listen to them. Ask them questions. Once they tell you their perspective, ask them questions about it. You know, is this what you're saying? I'm trying to understand. Now, what, what, what led you to think that? What brought you to that conclusion? So you, you're just trying to understand where they're coming from, how they reach that conclusion, and what impact it. And also, listen to their feelings. What do you sense they're feeling? Then say that to them, ask that to them. Yeah, you know, it seems to me like that, that you're really hurt by this, or, or that you're really angry about this. Whatever emotion you think is there, is that correct? And then they say, well, I'm not angry, I'm just, I'm hurt, or I'm not angry, I'm, you know, whatever. But ask questions. The more you ask questions, the more you will come to understand your teenager's actions, 
and what their their thoughts and what their feelings are. And the more you understand those things, then you can honestly say when you listen to them, you know, I think I'm beginning to see how you feel that way. And I'm thinking about if I were in your shoes, I probably feel the same way you do. You know, I, I had trouble understanding that at first, but I'm beginning to see now why you could feel that way and how you could feel that. Way. That that makes sense to me. Now, can can I share you? Can, can I share my perspective with you? And because you have listened to them and asked clarifying questions, and then affirmed their feelings, because if you were a teenager and you had their personality and you interpreted the situation the way they did, you would feel that way. And but when you say that, now you're not an enemy. Now you're not trying to convince them that they're wrong and you're right. And now they're more likely to listen to your perspective and come to understand your perspective. You see, you're really teaching them how to have a conversation when you may disagree on something with someone. So uh, quality time, quality conversations are really, really important for all teenagers. But for those for whom quality time is their language, well, this is super, super important to them, okay? But there's also quality activities that you do together. But if it's an activity, be sure you're giving attention to them, not just the activity. I remember a young man who said to me, my father and I go to football games, but he said, my father's more interested in football than he is in me. See, they're doing the same thing. They're together and they're arguing the game and it's a, it is a quality kind of situation. But because there's no conversation about things, either before or after the game, you know, yeah, there's not quality time. Now, if there's conversation after the game and you're really discussing what happened, now you, you, you've got quality time. So proximity is not to be confused with quality time. Just being with a teenager is not necessarily quality time. You're close to them. You, you know, you, it's proximity, but, but it's not quality time. So quality time is doing things together. I remember uh, when my son was a teenager, he, uh, he got into the guitar and uh, he got into Buddy Holly. Now, some of you don't remember Buddy Holly, <laughs> but he was a rock star in those days. And he got into Buddy Holly. So I got into Buddy Holly. And here's another clue. Whatever they get into, you get into. So you can talk intelligently about it. So I'd read Buddy Holly's words of his songs, you know, and I would say, man, I like this, Derek. Listen to this. And so one day I said to him, you know, Derek, I've got to go to Fort Worth, Texas to speak. Why don't you go with me? And when I get through speaking, you and I will drive out to Lubbock, Texas, and we will look at Buddy's hometown. Oh, Dad, I'd love to do that. <laughs> I had no idea how far it was from Fort Worth to Lubbock. <laughs> it's a long ride and not a lot out there, but tumbleweed railroad tracks. But we went out, we spent a whole day, went to the Chamber of Commerce. They gave us three pages. Actually, we spent two days going to where he went to school, where he went to church, where he uh, played his first record, where he was buried with the, the whole thing and drove all the way back talking about Buddy Holly and wonder what would have happened if he hadn't got killed in that plane crash. And man, now, now can I be honest? I didn't care a whole lot about Buddy Holly. He was already dead, okay? But he cared a whole lot about the son. Are you with me? Quality time. Taking a teenager out, a mom or a dad, just alone, the mom and the teenager, the dad and the teenager, for breakfast or for dinner and just having a conversation with them. I did that. We did that with our daughter and our son once a month. I took them out for breakfast, just, just alone, one at a time. Quality time. And for some young people, this is really, really what makes them money. Let me, let me give you an example of this one. Marcia is 14. She's, she said, I love it when my dad takes me with him when he goes fishing. To be honest with you, I really, I really don't like those smelly things, but I like being with dad. We talk about all kinds of things, and I really love getting up early. It's the best time I have with him. And then there's Kyle, he's 16. And proud of being an owner of his first driver's license. Quote, now that I can drive, I like going places without my parents, but I also like going do, doing things with them. I really like it when dad and I can do things together. Some of my friends don't have a father. I think I'm really fortunate. Monica, 14. 
lives with her mother and has little contact with her father. Quote, I like, what I like about mom is that we can talk about everything. We don't keep secrets. I feel really close to mom. She has helped me with a lot of problems. I know I can always tell her what's bothering me and she will help. So for those teenagers, quality time is their primary love language, okay? All right, number four is acts of service. Doing something for the teenager that you know they would appreciate or they would like for you to do. You know, this particular language as parents, we are forced to speak the day they're born because they can do nothing as an infant. We have to do everything. We put the food in, take the food out. We, we do everything for them in those, in those years. And, and we continue to do things for them that they cannot do for themselves. And we do that for several years. But there comes a time in which we speak this language not only by doing things for them, but by teaching them how to do things. That is, most teenagers would like to learn some skills. And you very likely have those skills or you know someone who does. So maybe they would like to learn, if they have driver's license, how to change a tire if it goes flat and they're out home by themselves. Who else is gonna teach them that? One of the things I suggest uh, to parents of teenagers is make a list of all the things you would like for your teenager to know how to do by the time they're 18 years old. In fact, let the teenagers help you make the list because then you get their input. You know, some of them are interested in cooking. My granddaughter at the age of 14 could cook a full meal. And every birthday she had, she wanted to bake her own cake because she decorated, she's very creative. She had an interest in cooking and her dad was a good cook. So her dad taught her how to cook. Not all teenagers are interested in cooking. But you might say, you know, if you were just totally by yourself, would you like to learn how to fry an egg? You know? <laughs> but you look for things that they would like to learn. Make a list and then age appropriately, uh, begin to teach them how to do those things. You know, I was uh, having dinner one night with a group of professional football players. I'd spoken to their group. And there was about, uh, I think, maybe four couples at the table. And one of them said, Dr. Jim, you know what we're struggling with? We don't know what we're going to do when we're too old to play football because we don't know how to do anything else. Since we were kids, all we've ever done is play football and we don't know how to do anything else. And one of them said, yeah, that's, my, that's has motivated me. I am now teaching my son how to do some stuff. I'm teaching him how to run a lawnmower. I'm teaching him how to change oil in his car. You know, I'm teaching him. Uh, well, they were just bringing out a point, you know, from their own experience that we need to learn to do some things before we get to be 18. Because at 18 in our culture, they typically are going off to college or they're going to get a job or they're going to join the military or, or they're going to do something, you know, we hope. <laughs> so let's prepare them. And this is not, even if it's not their primary language, it's still a way of communicating love and setting them up to be a success as adults. But for some of them, doing things for them is exceedingly important, especially things they cannot do for themselves. Uh, helping them with perhaps algebra or something else that they struggle with and maybe you're good at. Of course, if you're like me, you wouldn't be able to help them with their algebra. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, if you if you can sew and, uh, and they have a play at school and you make costumes for the play at school for them or others, man, that, that's like one of the greatest things you can do for them. Look, you look what my mama did, you know? Uh, I guess the daddy, I say the daddy, but I don't know many daddies that sew, okay? <laughs> but you take your skills and you do things for them. Uh, and you teach, yes, you teach them how to drive when the time comes for them to, to get a driver's license. But for some children, these acts of service are extremely important to them. Let me give you a flavor of what that sounds like from a teenager's perspective. Uh, Gray is 13. He lives with his mother and younger sister. His father left when Gray was seven. Quote, I know my mom loves me because she washes my messy clothes, fixes his supper every night, and helps me with the homework even when I don't ask her. She works hard as a nurse. 
so we can have food and clothes. I think my dad loves you, loves me, but he doesn't do much to help. Obviously, it's what his mom is doing for him, those acts of service that communicates love. Crystal is 14. She's the oldest of four children. Quote, I know my folks love me because they do so many things for me. Mom takes me to cheerleader practice and all the games. Daddy helps me with my homework, especially my math, which I hate. <laughs> Todd is 17. He has his own lawn service in the summer, and uh, he bought his first car. Quote, I got the greatest dad in the world. He taught me how to mow grass, start a business, and make money so I could buy a car. Last week, he showed me how to change spark plugs. And then Kristen is 13. Quote, I know my mom loves me because she takes time to teach me everything. Last week, she got me started on knitting. I'm going to make my own Christmas presents this year. So for these teenagers, acts of service is their primary uh, language. Then number five is gifts. It's universal to give and receive gifts as an expression of love. And for some teenagers, receiving gifts is important. I remember I was in uh, at the NATO base in uh, Germany. And one afternoon I was free and I was just taking a walk on the compound. And there was a young man sitting on a picnic table. And I judged him to be about 13 or 14. And I just kind of walked up to him and started a conversation with him. And I noticed he had a medallion around his neck, a St. Christopher medallion. And I said to him, I said, uh, what, what, what is a medallion? And, uh, he said, it's a St. Christopher medallion. I said, where did you get it? He said, my dad gave it to me when I, when I had my 13th birthday. And he told me that he wanted me to think, think about him when I saw it, if, when he was deployed. I said, man, that is a cool idea. I like that. I said, who was St. Christopher? He said he, uh, he, 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 he was a, a religious person that did a lot of good. <laughs> so, oh, that's wonderful. Obviously, it didn't have a lot of religious significance to him. But it had a lot of emotional significance to him. This is what my dad gave me when I turned 13. <sighs> to remember him when he happened to be deployed. Powerful, powerful gifts. Now, let me, let me clarify what a gift is. It comes from a Greek word, which means in the English, grace, unmerited favor. It's doing something for a teenager, not because they deserve it, not because they've done something for you, but just out of love. That's a true gift. You see, if you say to a teenager, if you'll clean your room up, I'll go get you that ball that you've been wanting. The ball is not a gift. The ball is payment for services rendered. They did their job. Now they get a ball. No, 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 no. A true gift is, is something you give them, not because they've done something that you wanted them to do. I mean, the kid next door will do that. You tell him to come and clean up the room and you give him a ball. He'll do that. You know, no, no. So a gift has to do with giving teenagers things they don't deserve necessarily. They haven't done anything to deserve it. You're giving it to them because you love them. Now, please don't hear me say that you give teenagers everything they ask for. You're the parent. They're the teenager. In most cases, parents are older than teenagers and thus have a little more wisdom. Don't give teenagers something you don't think they're ready for. They may be asking you for it. They may be begging you for it. They may tell you everybody in their room has one. <laughs> You could say, honey, I'm not responsible for everybody in your room. But I don't think that you're ready for this. And I love you too much to give you something I don't think you're ready for. And I can understand that you're disappointed, and you're hurt, but I have to do what I believe is best for you. And they will not be happy about it, but they'll come to appreciate it as time goes on. Okay? But just remember, you're the parent, and, and they're the teenager. However, you do look for things that they have an interest in, things that they would, that would foster that interest. Maybe if, if they have an interest in music, for example, and, uh, and they tell you something they would really, really like to have, a certain kind of guitar or a certain kind of whatever, 
that yes, that, that gift will be really, really meaningful to them because that's an interest they have. If they're into sports and you buy them sports equipment, that, 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 would, be, that would be super, super meaningful to them. But you see, those things are, are things that are fostering an interest that they have and perhaps abilities that they have. So choose gifts that would be meaningful to them. And if you know they have a favorite candy bar, you go grocery shopping, maybe just pick up a little candy bar, not a big one, but it's their favorite. And say, I was thinking about you, man, and I got you one. Oh, that's great. It doesn't have to be expensive gifts. We've always said it's the thought that counts. So you think about what would be meaningful to them and what would communicate to them that I'm thinking about them, that I love them, that I really appreciate them. So we give gifts and we give them, uh, we give them wise. Just a, an, an example or two of, of this particular uh, uh, love language. Michelle is 15. Uh, we asked her uh, uh, how she knew that her parents loved her. And she said, uh, she pointed to her, her blouse, her skirt, her shoes, and then she said this, everything I have, they gave me. In my mind, that's love. They have given me not only the things I need, but far more. And then uh, Serena, she is a senior in high school. And she says this about her parents. I look around my room and I see constant reminders of my parents' love. My books, computer, furniture, and clothes have all been given to me by my folks over the past few years. I still remember the night they gave me my computer. My father had already connected it and my mom had wrapped it in golden paper. And when I cut the ribbon, computer screen read, happy birthday, Sonera, we love you. You can tell how meaningful that gift was for her. And let me just say this. Sometimes we don't get emotional credit for our gifts to teenagers because we don't present them in a celebratory way. You know, Christmas, we wrap up the gifts. Birthdays, we wrap up the gifts. But sometimes we buy clothes for them when school starts back, and we don't wrap them up. We just clip off the cubes and wash them and get them, put the clothes in their drawer in their closet. Sometimes they don't even realize it is a gift. But wrap them up, even if it's not birthdays and Christmas. And then uh, Ryan is 14 years old. Quote, I guess the reason I know my parents love me is they give me so much. They often surprise me by giving me things that they know I would like to have. It's not just what they give me, but it's the way they do it. My family makes a big deal of giving gifts, and it doesn't even, and it doesn't even have to be my birthday. And then Jeff, who's 17, he says, uh, this car is a collection of my family. My dad and I bought the car 50-50, but everything else I received as gifts. The mats on the floor were given by my sister to celebrate my buying the car. Mom and dad gave me the stereo on my 17th birthday. The wheel covers, my mom gave me one each week for four weeks, always on a different night of the week, so I would be surprised. <laughs> so here's the basic idea. Out of those five love languages, each teenager has a primary love language. That is, one of the five speaks more deeply to them emotionally than the other four. And if you don't give heavy doses of their primary love language, likely they will not feel loved, even though you're speaking some of the other languages. This is the key concept. Now, please don't hear me say that you only speak the child's primary love language. No, 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 no. It's giving heavy doses on a regular basis of the primary language. But you sprinkle in the other four because we want that teenager to learn how to receive love and give love in all five languages. That's the healthiest adult. Most of us did not receive all five growing up. So we came to adulthood and we didn't know how to do some of these. Now, the good thing is you can learn to speak any of these languages as an adult, but the healthiest teenager emotionally is the one who learned how to receive love in all five and give love in all five. But don't miss the main point. Determine their primary language and then focus on that. And can I give you just a couple of ideas on how to discover their love language? One, in a serious moment, individually with one teenager, you say to them, 
You know, uh, I've been thinking about how I could be a better husband to your mother and a better father to you. So I want to ask you a serious question. Could you tell me what I could do to be a better father? And get ready, because your aunt, his aunt, his answer, or her answer, will tell you their family language. And the mother does the same thing. I've been thinking about how to be a better wife to your dad, if, if, if the dad's in the home, but, but how to be a better mother. And I want to ask you a serious question. Could you tell me something I could do to be a better mother? Their answer will tell you their primary language. Here's a couple of other clues. How do they express love to other people? I mean, just observe their behavior. If they're always giving high fives and hitting people on the back, physical touch is probably their language. If they're always giving affirming words to people, it's probably their language because we tend to speak the language we want to receive. So that's a clue. Second, what do they request of you most often? If they request of you as a teenager to take a walk with them, and they do that on a regular basis, Dad, can we, well, not my daughter did that, Dad, can we take a walk after dinner? That tells you their language is quality time. I, I want to be with you. I want to talk with you. Uh, and, and then the third uh, question is uh, that you ask yourself is, what do they complain about most often? The complaint reveals the love language. If they say to you, for example, I don't ever please you, they're telling you that words of affirmation is their language and they don't ever hear words of affirmation. If they, if they tell you, uh, you know, I just wish you'd hug me like you hug sister, they're complaining. They're not getting physical touch and they're asking for it. So you put those things together, you can pretty well figure out a teenager's love language. Now, you can go online and take a free quiz. The teenager can take a free quiz. It's called five love languages.com. The number five, five love languages.com. There's a quiz there for married couples. There's a quiz there for single adults, but there's also a quiz there for teenagers. And that teenager will take that quiz and the results will tell you what their most important one is, what is second and right down the line. And it will, it'll be a valuable information for you. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to stop there because I want to leave time for questions. So let me, uh, let us move uh, to whatever questions have come in. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. Okay. Some of the questions we got in. Um, do the five love languages of teenagers work for youth with autism? That is a great question. And uh, I have written a book with a co-author on that very topic on how these works with children who have various, uh, you know, uh, struggles, whether it's autism or other, other things. I wish I could remember the title of that book. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've written a lot of books that don't remember the titles of some of them. But if you go to fivelovelanguages.com and click on resources, uh, you will find uh, you will find the title of that book, and you can order that book either on that uh, website or you can order it from Amazon. But yes, uh, the love languages do work with autistic children, but obviously it's it, there's some differences there, and that's what that book is all about. Is is the differences with someone who has autism or any other uh, you know thing that they're struggling with that's that is a little bit out of the norm. So I think you'll find that book to be very, very helpful. Thank you so much. And Erica, just put that in the chat for everyone listening. Um, thank you so much. Um, so another question, what can you do if your child isn't satisfied with your efforts in speaking their love language? For example, if quality time isn't enough for them? Well, it may be that they have a secondary love language that is very close to their primary love language. This sometimes happens. I, I, I tend to call those people bilingual. <laughs> you know, mm. take the quiz, for example, two of them comes out almost even. And so uh, maybe if quality time is a little bit more, and so that actually is their quality, uh, is their primary language. But if their secondary is very close, then they also need heavy doses of that secondary. So that would be my the most logical thing, my logical guess as to what might be going on there. Is that I really, really appreciate the quality time but the other one is they're very important and they're not getting that enough for them to feel loved. Okay, great. Um, 
Next one, um, how do you strengthen communication with an introverted child? Okay, let's face it, a lot of people in the world are introverted, okay? And that is by nature, they're just not free flowing. Some of you are married to somebody like that and you keep saying to them, and <laughs> they, they give a sentence and you say, and <laughs> you want them to do more. <laughs> so listen, nothing wrong with being introverted or extroverted, okay? Those are personality traits that we don't choose. It's just part of our personality. But I think one of the most important things you can do with a, first, a child, teenager that seems to be introverted is to ask more questions. Now, I know what a lot of parents will say. Well, I ask them the question and they say uh, nothing or uh, I don't know, or they, well, they won't respond. <laughs> well, uh, the key there is learning to ask questions about something in which they have an interest. If it's music, if it's uh, sports, if it's, what, if it's whatever, if it's reading certain kind of books, you know, it's questions about those books because of whatever it is they're into, they will talk about more freely. So find out their interest. And, and then if you have to write the questions down, write, write some of them down until you get comfortable asking them. But they will talk about things in which they are interested. Perfect. Um, another question. Um, do some children have different love languages for different parents? So different love language um, for their mom and for dad? It's a good question, and uh, I don't necessarily think they have a different love language, but here's what I think happens. Through the years, they've gotten one of these love languages from dad more often than, than another, and a different love language from their mother that's different from, from the other, different from the father. So they've learned that if they want a hug, they go to dad. If they want words of affirmation, they go to mother. So it's something they've learned. They don't even know the love, they don't even have to know the love language concept. It's just that they know that dad will give me a hug and mom will give me words of affirmation. So they, they, they expect those things from those two. I don't think it necessarily reflects their, their, either one of those is their primary love language. They just know both of those are important to them and they know where to go to get them. Awesome. Um, another question that came in, do you believe that with teenagers, since they change so frequently, that their love language changes frequently also? Yes, I don't think that the love language does change, but you're exactly right because their emotions are going up and down all the time and largely because of their circumstances, something that happened during the day has given them an up or down. Uh, and so uh, one love language might be more important than another at a particular point. Uh, here's a little thing you can, a little word thing you can do with a teenager uh, to find out what would be meaningful today. You say, on a scale of zero to 10, how much love do you feel coming from me? And if they say anything less than 10, you say, well, what could I do to bring it up? What could I do today to bring it up? And now you know exactly what would bring it up on that particular day. And yes, on one day uh, or another day, their primary love language may not be the thing they asked for that day. It's just that they have a felt need in that particular area. So that little, that little game, uh, word game, that little question. Uh, and incidentally, you can use that with your husband and wife as well to know what would really be meaningful for them today. Uh, I think that's a way to kind of get into where they really are. Um, also, do you suggest learning the love languages of other children in your life, um, you know, such as your nieces, nephews, your grandchildren um, that are also teens? I think it would be helpful, no question about it, if you know the love language of, uh, you, of those uh, extended uh, relatives, and especially if you have, if you interface with them, uh, you know, on a regular basis, you might uh, encourage their parents to, uh, to read the book and, and get the concept if they don't have it already, get the concept so that they could then tell you uh, the language of those various teenagers. But yes, this works in all human relationships, all human relationships, regardless of our age and, and regardless of our family setting. Every human has a need, emotional need to feel loved by the significant people in their lives. And if they don't feel loved, it'll have a detrimental effect on everything else in their lives. If they do feel loved, it'll have a positive effect. 
Um, and um, last question, unless I get some more in. Um, are love languages, are they innate or are they learned? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've often asked that question. Is it nature or nurture? Mm -hmm. Are they born with it or do they learn it early? I do know this. You can discover a child's love language by the time they're four years old by just observing their behavior. How do they respond to you and other people that they interface with? For example, my son's love language is physical touch. When he was four years old, I would come home from work. He would run to the door, grab my legs, and climb on me. He's touching me because he wants to be touched. Our daughter never did that. At that age, she would say, Daddy, come into my room. I want to show you something. She wanted quality time, my undivided attention. And so uh, it's there early, but I don't know if, it, if it's uh, nature or nurture. You know, there are other personality traits that are there early, like order. There are four-year-olds that have all their toys, you know, organized. And they're four-year-olds that everything's just thrown in a box. <laughs> Where'd they get that? Well, maybe they were taught it, but maybe it was just there. So I don't know. I just know it is there early. Uh, in our lives, and it, it tends to go with us throughout a lifetime. Now, uh, I'll answer this question. It, it may change in depending on stages of life. For example, a mother who has two preschool children, acts of service may not be her primary language, but during those years, it's probably going to jump to the top because she's overwhelmed. So certain stages of life and certain circumstances, uh, another love language may jump to the top. So, uh, uh, I'm not dogmatic, you know, on the fact that it's with us throughout a lifetime, but I do think like many personality traits, it tends to stay with us throughout our lives. Okay, we actually have two more questions. Sorry about that. Um, as a parent, acts of service is huge. We are constantly doing things for our kids. Um, my kids don't seem to get it. Um, I think they just assume this is what a parent's job is. Is there a way to allow them to see the love in acts of service? I think if they understand this concept, and incidentally, there is a book that I wrote for teenagers. It's called A Teen's Guide to the Five Love Languages. Mm -hmm. So if a teen, and it's, and it's a much smaller book, if a teen reads that book, they get the concept themselves. And they can begin to see, oh, mom is really speaking this language loudly. But they also will be able to say, you know, but my love language is this. See, one of the reasons that they are not acknowledging that as an expression of love, perhaps, is that's not their primary language. There's something else that's their primary language. And so if you focus on their primary, they're, they're going to feel up. They're not getting what, see, this happens in a marriage as well. A husband can say, you know, I, I wash dishes, I vacuum floors, I wash the car, I mow the grass, and she says she doesn't feel up. <laughs> well, he's right. He's loving her with acts of service, but her language may be quality time, and they don't ever sit down and talk. So I would say that would be the most common thing, but I would encourage uh, parents of teenagers to, uh, once you're familiar with this concept, uh, let your teenager read that a teen's guide to the five love language. You, you, again, you can find that at fivelovelanguages.com, or you can also find it, uh, you know, online, uh, order it from Amazon. Okay, another question. Um, my child complains that I don't love them and that I don't like them. I like everyone else more and I wish they weren't alive and so forth. Um, I'm given words of praise and words of affection um, and affirming, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. Um, what do I do? Yeah, well, again, I think uh, there's nothing wrong with giving words of affirmation, but if that's not their language, it will not mean to them what it would mean to another child for whom words is their language. So I would say, uh, let's try to discover their love language and let's find out what the primary love language is. Uh, in addition to the things I gave earlier, uh, you know, you can also uh, do a little experiment. Uh, you can say to them, you know, I've got a free hour and we could either take a walk together in the woods or in the park, or we could go buy that uh, whatever that you've been wanting. Wh which would you rather we do? See, one is quality time and one is a gift, and they make a choice. 
So you're given choices between two things like that for a period of time and keep a record. And you'll find that one of those languages begins to jump to the top. And the other question would be what I kind of alluded to earlier, and that is you say to that teenager, you know, I really, really love you, but I know you really don't feel right. So what I want to know is, what would make me a better mother? And again, that question, their answer will probably tell you their primary love language. Perfect. Um, another question that we had come in, um, do you see differences in genders and preferred love languages? No, these are not gender specific. Uh, a, a teenage a young guy or a young gal can have either any one of these five as their primary language. They're, they're, they're not gender specific. All right, and last question. Um, any suggestions for meeting love languages when you are feeling overwhelmed or pulled in multiple directions? Well, let's face it. The raising teenagers or younger children uh, can be stressful. <laughs> There's no question about it in today's world. And especially if you're a full-time you know, full job, you know, husbands and wives both have full-time jobs, or you're a single mom and you have a full-time job. Uh, yes, it can be overwhelming. But I think uh, what we have to think about is priorities. What is most important at this stage of my life? And if you have a teenage son or daughter, I want to suggest that your relationship with them becomes extremely important. You only have those years, those teenage years, to have an impact and build a relationship with them. So maybe you think in terms of what are some things that I could give up, that I could change in my, in my schedule that would allow me more breathing room to invest time and energy in, in, in raising my teenagers. And the other factor also would be to ask, are there family members or friends who could do some of the things for me that I'm doing that might give me more time uh, to invest in my teenagers? And many times their friends are family, extended family members who would love to help, but they don't, they don't know that you need help or that you, you would be open to help. So don't, don't be ashamed to ask, you know, would it be possible for you to and tell them what you think would be helpful to them and, and just see. And if they say no, you say, well, I fully, fully understand that. You know, just thought I would ask. Dr. Chapman, I cannot thank you enough um, for joining us today for this webinar. It has been phenomenal. Um, the chat has been going crazy. Just thanking you for sharing your wisdom with us. We are so appreciative of your time today. Um, and we will send out this recording and other resources to everyone that's here today. Thank you so much. Well, thank Have you. I enjoyed <laughs> being with you and I hope it will be fruitful in the lives of all who, uh, who have heard and listened. Thank you. Thank you so much.